And so I'm very, very pleased and proud to welcome to the stage Jeremy Hymans. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thanks so much, Gabe. Uh, and, you know, uh, to, to kind of back up what was said earlier, what an incredible thing you've put together here. It's, it's an amazing community. So uh, I'm in awe of what you've achieved over these last years as well. Uh, and very excited to be here among you. Um, apologies for the Australian accent. I am going to talk quite a bit about Australia today, actually, in this speech. But, uh, but what I'm really here to talk to you about is movement building and how you guys might take some of the fantastic engagement that you're creating with the games that you're building, with the gamification that you're building into what you do, and potentially turn that into a real movement, turn that into something long term and something that might you know, eventually change the world. And I'm hoping that you'll be using your powers for good uh, and not evil. So I'm hoping that nobody comes away from this speech with a blueprint to build a, uh, a movement to encourage teenage smoking. But, um, but let me start by telling you a little bit of my own story, because I think it's instructive in terms of what it takes in the 21st century to build a movement and the kinds of possibilities that are open to you. And then I'm going to connect that to some of the discussion that you guys have been having over the last couple of days on games. So this is, uh, this is, this is Australia in 2005. Uh, here's this guy. His name is John Howard. He was the prime minister of our country for almost 10 years. And this was a person that I just couldn't stand. He represented everything that I didn't like. He was super conservative. He wanted to, uh, he wanted to lock up refugees in desert prisons. He refused to apologize to uh, indigenous people. So as a, as a bleeding heart liberal like me, uh, I, was, uh, I was kind of appalled by this guy. The problem was uh, I was in my, I was in my mid 20s. I'd never been involved with any political party. Uh, I'd never been involved in politics really at all in Australia. Uh, and yet, I wanted to figure out how to build a movement that might help topple this guy uh, and actually change my country. So me and my friend David, here we are. This is the day uh, we created this new movement. Uh, standing there in front of Parliament House, uh, all we really had was a story. All we really had was an idea uh, that we might be able to use technology to engage people in new ways. So in, uh, in an act, I would say, of, of some chutzpah, you know, we created GetUp. And the idea of GetUp was that GetUp would say, look, the political parties in Australia have failed. Uh, people have lost hope in Australia. We're going to build a movement and we're going to change all of that. And uh, when we started the movement, there really was none. We made this television ad uh, bravely proclaiming that Australians are starting a new movement. The movement was, in this case, my sister and, uh, and, and, and my niece. Um, but actually, something very interesting happened. So the first thing we did with GetUp is we built a tool that enabled um, anyone anywhere to just write directly to their elected officials uh, in a very seamless way, uh, articulating the issues that they cared about and the things that they wanted to hold them account about. And believe it or not, in 2005, no such tool existed in Australia. And so suddenly, um, we built this thing. We said we built a movement. We're going to hold this government to account. And uh, with, within a couple of days of announcing this, tens of thousands of people had emailed their representatives using this tool, you know, talking about this new movement. And the reaction from the powers that be was very interesting. So uh, the kind of government minister responsible uh, for the Howard government gets up on national television and he says in horror, there are hundreds of emails arriving in senators' offices. There are actually tens of thousands. They're beside themselves just to clear the screen. This is highly irresponsible. This is spam. So when the people of Australia who'd done this in very large numbers were told by their government that uh, personal letters to their representatives uh, were spam, they were outraged. And that, in fact, was the beginning of a movement. We, we were able to use that seed to grow a real movement. Uh, this is GetUp today. Believe it or not, GetUp is the largest political organization in Australia. It actually has more members than all of Australia's political parties put together. And what was key to the success of GetUp, which, by the way, played a role in the defeat of John Howard, uh, woohoo, in 2007, for any Aussies in the room, uh, and you know, has subsequently played an important role in changing the constitution of my country, of winning a whole bunch of landmark legislation, 
um, was, was the fact that we took people seriously. We gave them a way using technology to scale their participation in ways that were simply not possible before, and we created a brand that felt and genuinely was not a top-down institution. It genuinely took the voices of people seriously. It made people want to dress their dogs up in, in Get Up t-shirts, which you don't see a lot of modern political parties uh, pulling off. So the, the quick story after that was we then decided to try to take those learnings global. So got together with a group of folks from around the world and started uh, an organization called Avaz. And Avaz was basically trying to solve this problem, which is the asymmetry at the global level between governments and corporations who have huge power and ordinary people who often have no voice in decisions about, let's say, climate change or global poverty because they're too big and too complex. So we built this big standing army of ordinary people who could intervene very quickly at those key decision-making moments. And we sort of said, look, global opinion, global public opinion has to be the new superpower. And today of ours has 21 million members in every country on Earth. It operates in 14 languages. And it's a great example of these new kinds of transnational movements uh, that I then set out to build. So where that all led to was creating purpose. And what we decided to do was take all of the stuff we'd been learning about how to build really meaningful, authentic movements that actually got a lot of, you know, a lot of big stuff in the world done and take that to a whole bunch of other spheres of the world. So we built purpose as a home for creating movements. And we basically we work in two ways. So we work with existing companies, organizations, foundations in, in using these movement building techniques to achieve big stuff, to create their own movements. Uh, and we create movements of our own. We're an incubator for new stuff, which is where we learn a bunch. So I want to give you one example of, our, of a game we created within the context of a broader movement. And then I'm going to share with you some interesting lessons. So uh, before I do that, actually, um, the, the, you know, the team we put together to do purpose was different to the teams that we'd built before. And so what we decided to do is that if you're going to build a movement in the 21st century, you actually need to combine a bunch of skills that you wouldn't think you needed to combine. So purpose brings together political organizers, obviously technologists, designers, but it also brings together behavioral economists, because we figure out that in order to kind of build movements that really stuck, you needed to think a lot about behavior, which is what you guys are thinking about a lot when you're designing games. And then you put those people together with people who actually can do the storytelling and the narrative making that actually makes things make sense to people. So a couple of years back, we did this in the context of the issue of cancer. And we were working with the organization Livestrong. And uh, this was obviously before the, uh, the doping. And uh, I can say quite assuredly that I was not involved in taking performance enhancing drugs. Um, but, uh, but in the context of Livestrong, they came to us and said, hey, we've got this amazing brand, we've got all these people who wear our wristbands, but we don't know how to turn that into a movement. We don't know how to engage those people in a more robust way. Um, how do we actually make those people activists who do real stuff for us in the world, who lobby their politicians, who organize their family and friends around cancer prevention? So we decided um, to build a movement uh, that brought all of those people who were sort of nascent supporters of Livestrong together and turned them into real activists. And at the end of the, the time we did that, we had about 1.5 million people who'd become committed activists for Livestrong. And as part of that, we built a game. But I want to emphasize that the game was not the be-all and the end-all. It was a device that we used to recruit people and to do some of the framing and the narrative making that was necessary to make people feel really bonded to the movement. And so the key insight that this game used was something that we were discovering and our political organizers discovered as they were trying to figure out how best to organize people around cancer. And they figured out that the best way to talk about cancer was not to talk about statistics, was not to talk about like funding, but actually to anchor it in people's connection to the people in their lives they knew who had cancer. We felt we found that emotionally what people most wanted to do was honor their friends and family who either had cancer or might have passed, um, or if they were survivors, who cared for them through this kind of period in which they'd been through the most trying period of their life. So we built a game around this whole idea, and we built a set of incentives around it. So Lance was writing in the Tour of California. So we created a 12-day game to mirror what was happening in the Tour of California. And we invited people 
to create a bike uh, and to ride in honor of someone in this race that, that was the game, in honor of someone they knew who had cancer. And so uh, basically what happened was we said to the Livestrong membership, create this, create this, uh, create a game. You could basically, you know, you could choose your gender, you could choose your color. There were some things about the dynamic that was fun. Um, and then people uh, in the super user category became riders. The job of the riders was to recruit other people into the movement by getting them to cheer for them in the race. And by cheering in the race, they advanced in the game. And we linked that to a set of incentives that were both altruistic and based on self-interest. And this is a really important insight in movement building. It turns out that movement building isn't all about altruism. You also need to link to people's vanity and to people's self-interest. So in this case, we kind of had this dual structure. So uh, there was an altruistic component, which was that uh, as the entire group met certain goals in order to make people feel like they were part of something bigger, donations were unlocked from Radio Shack, who was sort of sponsoring the event, uh, the game. And so as the group met goals, not individuals, these large donations were unlocked at each stage. At the individual level, there was a leaderboard, and essentially the reward um, for, uh, for winning at different levels was getting your name on Lance's bike as he rode through the Tour of California and other, and other races and a set of other things. So we created this dual structure. We made the interaction design really interesting. Our behavioral economists thought, OK, how do we design this in a way that keeps people's interest over 12 days? So we found a way to kind of refresh the game every day. Uh, our interaction designers built the sort of surprise and delight stuff. Our political organizers connected it to a bigger story, which was that we actually had an urgent policy ask, which was that we were trying to get cancer made part of the Millennium Development Goals and addressed by the global community. And in a very short period of time, we got hundreds of thousands of people involved in this game. And from a movement building perspective, those people were actually signed up to join the movement. And we got that data, which then enabled us to re-engage them. So a couple of other lessons I think might be interesting to you. One is what we're finding in our work every day is that spin is meeting its match. And that uh, the kind of work that we do requires things that um, do not rely on top-down communications at all. So this is an example of a campaign that I think is, is, is a good example of where spin becomes disastrous. So Chevron ran a campaign a couple of years ago, I don't know if any of you guys remember this, called We Agree, in which they proudly proclaimed, they had sort of, sort of slightly generic statements like, Oil companies should be nice. We agree. And, uh, and uh, they released this campaign. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars on paid media. It was a huge, huge effort. They, of course, were trying to present themselves as pro-environment, even though they're one of the biggest uh, funders of climate change denialism. Uh, and so uh, this is something that the Yes Men did. The Yes Men are a troop of improvis improvisational uh, kind of political satirists. And they created this really cool online structure that basically allowed people to subvert the structure. So people could take the We Agree ads, remix them in the ways that you see there, uh, and basically undermine the premise. It turned out that this, of course, ha had far more virality and currency than the ads themselves. So we're moving from a place where we make sound bites that are very polished and well composed to what I would call meme drops where people are delivering a set of imagery, like the Occupy Wall Street campaign, the 99%, the idea of Occupy, a set of images, and then allowing people to manipulate them, remix them, spread them, and therefore propagate them. And that's the way in which movements are spreading today. But my message for you today is that memes, or for that matter games, are not enough. That it's important to build for the long term. So this is a, this is a concept that we call the commitment curve. And it's basically the idea that in order to engage people, you start by bringing them in with a very low barrier to entry action, something very simple. You progressively build their commitment over time, and you scale the movement that way. And the individual actions you take, like engagement in the game, have to be encased in this broader commitment uh, curve and in this broader narrative, which is often missing, in my view, from these kinds of things. So this is an example of a particular moment in time, a campaign that GetUp ran, that I think is a great example of how you can turn a story into a movement. And I'm going to play this video for you.
So, so that, that one always leaves you with a lump in your throat. Um, the important thing here was that you know, we were creating a really engaging experience here. Uh, you know, we got 7 million YouTube views at one point. I guess Katy Perry didn't have a hit that week. It was actually the most popular video in the world on YouTube uh, we, 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 without cats. Um, but, <laughs> but the key thing there was it was part of something bigger. We'd built this whole movement uh, in Australia that had a huge membership, about 5% of the population, which enabled us to take that moment and turn it into power. In that case, we used that video to raise a huge amount of money in crowdfunded donations in order to support uh, a campaign on the eve of a big, a big vote in Australia to make gay marriage part of the governing party's platform. And uh, that vote was won. So what I encourage you to do in your own work is take these engaging experiences you create, the moments of addiction, the feedback loops, the surprise and delight, all the stuff you've been talking about over the last two days, and use those powers for good and build them in the context of a real movement, of something that has community and identity and a purpose that is bigger, uh, uh, that is bigger than just something small uh, and vacuous. That's what we kind of cook up every day uh, over in New York at Purpose, but I'd really encourage you to take that uh, into your own work uh, and think about how you could turn your games uh, and your engagement into something much, much bigger. So thank you so much. Thank you.